pack of heritage breed sheep. This webinar is brought to you by the Let's Grow Committee of the American Sheep Industry Association. We want to thank them for their support and encourage you to visit the ASI website to learn more about the sheep industry and to access the large volume of resources available there to help you be successful in the sheep business. The URL for the ASI website is www.sheepusa.org. If you are not currently a member of the American Sheep Industry Association, I'd like to encourage you to become one. Most people do that by joining their state sheep association. A list of the contact people for those associations is available on the ASI website under the contacts link. There's also a join link at the top of the page where you can read more about the association activities and the benefits of membership. I'd like to remind our listeners that this webinar is being recorded. All webinar registrants will receive a follow-up email within the next 48 hours with a link to the webinar recording, as well as a link to access the webinar slides. The links will also be posted on the ASI website alongside the recordings of our previous webinars in the Let's Grow educational materials. I'd like to ask our uh, presenters to go ahead and uh, turn on their cameras this evening here so you can see some of them that have the cameras anyway. Um, so we got a full slate of speakers here tonight, if you can see from our uh, title slide here. Um, so we're going to start off with Jeanette Berenger, uh, giving us an overview of the Livestock Conservancy work. And I'll introduce each of these speakers in a little more detail uh, here in a moment or, or as they begin to speak. And then we got three producers with us, Leslie Johnson, Brian Larson, and and Uji McGuire um, that will each uh, share some really nice pictures of the sheep that they work with and tell some of the stories of their experiences uh, working with heritage breed sheep. Uh, we're hoping to have about 15 or 20 minutes at least at the end uh, uh, for questions, um, but feel free to uh, submit those questions at any time, including when the speakers are talking by using the uh, question box in the lower right-hand corner of your control panel. I'll be monitoring those throughout the evening and, and keep track of uh, who was speaking when you asked your question, if that makes a difference on, on how we ask it. Uh, but we'll wait till the end to actually address all of those during our Q&A session. Um, so with that, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce Jeanette in a little more detail here, and uh, we'll see the rest of the speakers here in a moment when it's, when it's their, uh, their turn to speak. Um, so hold on a second here. All right, Jeanette, if you want to go ahead and advance that first slide, it's not advancing on mine. I must have shut something off. Okay. Um, hopefully it's advanced. Uh, hi, um, Jay, thank you so much for inviting us to do this. Well, hold on just a second here, Jeanette. I'm not sure why that's not moving. Huh. What took place here? My machine. Should I tell a joke? To, yeah, you might have to, Jeanette. My machine <laughs> appears to have frozen here. So let me see. Well, I can start uh, talking. Well, um, let me. You know, Hold on, it's just a moment. You could go ahead and tell them a little bit about yourself while I switch this over. I'm just going to switch over to the other machine is what I'm going to do. Sure. Uh, so I'm, I'm Jeanette Barringer, and I work for the Livestock Conservancy as their senior program manager. And for those of you that are not familiar with the Conservancy, uh, we are a national nonprofit, and uh, we were established in 1977. Uh, with the mission to basically conserve uh, rare breeds. And uh, the reason being is because we're trying to conserve biodiversity for agriculture. And so it's a very specific group of animals that we're targeting for conservation. And they're basically breeds that if we were to lose them tomorrow, there's no way to recreate them genetically. 
So they're foundational type breeds that um, are really important to biodiversity. And um, sheep is one of the more numerous uh, species that we work with because there, there are quite a few uh, rare breeds that have um, become rare because they've been outcompeted by uh, faster growing or finer wooled breeds. And so um, we're trying to not only conserve them, but to try and give them a job back because, uh, you know, being a lawn ornament or, you know, a pet or just a small hobby um, farm um, isn't going to conserve a breed. And so we do try to find ways to give them their jobs back and uh, get people excited about them. And uh, we do all kinds of work. We uh, do DNA work to try and understand the, the breeds better, uh, historical documentation so we can tell the story of the breeds better, and to work with farmers, both um, veteran farmers and newbies to help them each be more successful with their breeds. And so uh, we do quite a few uh, different things that help to support the, the breeds we work with. And I was going to start talking about um, some of the breeds that um, we do have listed on what we call the conservation priority list. And this is a, a list of animals that um, fit our criteria, whether they're critically endangered, that would be the, the most rare, and then you've got threatened where, um, you know, they're not quite as rare, uh, watch, and then we also have a study category and recovering category. And so these are, this is just a quick overview of some of the breeds we work with. Uh, the British long wolves um, are in, um, many of them are, are struggling, and uh, that would include Cotswold, the Leicester long wolves, and the Lincolns, and uh, the newly added Teeswater, which just came on our conservation priority list uh, just this past year. And so um, it's a uh, important group of animals that we um, uh, have uh, some challenges to, to help with marketing. And uh, later on, uh, Brian will be talking about his Lincolns and uh, the great work that's being done with them. And um, I'm trying to advance this and I don't want to do, did the slide advance for me? Oh, there we go. Uh -huh. So the next category of, of sheep is, uh, again, a lot of British sheep uh, we work with. Um, the Clun Forest, Dorset Horn, Oxford, Shropshire, and South Down. And um, then we have some other categories, uh, which hopefully this slide will advance. Uh, the British colored breeds, uh, Black Welsh Mountain, uh, Jacob, and Shetland. So uh, many, many uh, British breeds, and I'm, I'm happy to say we, we work very closely with our British counterparts at the Rare Breed Survival Trust and um, have a really great collaborative uh, relationship with them because we share so many breeds in common, and um, many of them really need genetics um, exchange on both sides of the Atlantic and so um, we we love working with them and then we've got the uh, Spanish descent animals including Florida cracker Gulf Coast Navajo churro Santa Cruz um, these are breeds that aren't well known outside of where they have been developed um, not like um, lots of folks that haven't heard of some of these um, uh, these are um, very often very um, well adapted to extreme climates. Uh, the Gulf Coast and the Florida crackers are extremely uh, heat resistant breeds and um, parasite resistant and live in areas in the deep south that other sheep w would struggle to thrive in. And then you have sheep like the Navajo churro that are more um, dry and arid type climates that they're adapted to. And uh, Santa Cruz, they're uh, very adaptable sheep and um, they, uh, because of uh, island life, they um, 
are not as predator leery as they should be. So they take a little extra attention to protect from uh, predators. But all in all, these uh, Spanish descent sheep are uh, very rough and tumble breeds and um, easy keepers and long lived and great mothers. And, and um, for somebody looking for a sheep that doesn't need a, a lot of help, um, these are the kind of breeds that you'd um, want to choose. And uh, gosh, the lag time between the. There you go. Did the slide advance? Yes, it did. On our end, anyway. <laughs> okay. Um, Okay, <laughs> yeah, I just did it. Sorry <laughs> about that. Uh, some more American breeds, uh, Hog Island, um, Caracal. Um, we have Caracal slash American because the population in the United States was isolated uh, for a long, long time. Um, there are tens of thousands or more of uh, Caracals in the Middle East, but they're a little bit different than the Caracals that are here in the United States. And so um, from a genetic standpoint, it kind of makes sense for us to uh, list them because they are a genetic resource that's different from the animals that are found in the Middle East. Um, the Hog Island is a um, uh, formerly feral population. And what's really neat about these sheep is they are uh, the last remnant of the sheep that were brought over with uh, early uh, English settlers. We have a lot of Spanish origin sheep, but the, not a lot of uh, English origin that's only found here. The equivalent of the Hog Island in the UK no longer exists. And so um, it's a very interesting population. Um, uh, they can shed naturally, but they are a, a wool breed. Um, we have the Romaldale CVMs, which the um, fiber artists are really liking quite a bit. And uh, the tuna sheep, which was developed by uh, Thomas Jefferson and some of his uh, contemporaries. And it's a, a wonderful um, meat breed as well as wool and um, just a, a lovely breed. They're fairly heat adapted. Uh, you know, we've We've got a major breeder down here in North Carolina that has had a lot of success with them. And um, so they're another great uh, all around breed that uh, we work with and um, is adapted for warm climates. Um, and just waiting for my next slide. Uh, so, um, American, uh, we have a lot of uh, breeds from America that um, are on our list as well as the, the British. And uh, gosh, it's still lagging. I'll try it once more. I'm not sure. Okay. There we go. Parachute. Aha. Uh -huh. Okay, so we do have a, a number of hair sheep that we work with. Uh, uh, St. Croix, another uh, great animal that's uh, heat adapted and also very small for people that are getting older or for people that can't handle a huge sheep. The St. Croix is a really great fit. Uh, Wiltshire Horn is a larger, more meaty animal, um, very uh, rough and tumble breed that um, is uh, having some pretty decent success with um, the meat market. And um, there's uh, the Barbados black belly, which is another uh, Caribbean sheep that is also um, experiencing some uh, renewed interest in them. Another one that's uh, heat adapted and, uh, you know, kind of eye candy. Um, the biggest challenge with the Barbados is not to get confused with American Barbados, and those are mouflon crosses. And uh, those were largely created to be, uh, to serve as uh, game animals and they're not considered the original breed of uh, Barbados black belly. Um, but there's um, quite a few of the American Barbados around and uh, much fewer Barbados black belly uh, purebreds that are naturally pulled. They, they don't have horns. Uh, 
So some of the things we do to conserve these breeds, uh, certainly census, we uh, have a volunteer that works with us year round and her only job year round is to call up the breed associations and see how many animals are out there each year. We do maintain herd books, so uh, Hog Island sheep and Santa Cruz sheep and Wiltshire Horn, we maintain those stud books. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, DNA analysis, um, documentation of stories, and also um, uh, product qualities. There, for many of these breeds, there's, a not, there's not a lot written about um, what are their meat characteristics, what are the best cooking techniques for them, um, are any of them good for, for milking, and um, so we're trying to document as much as we can so that when somebody wants to take on one of these breeds, we can give them a, a great uh, expectation for what that breed is all about. And then, of course, we do a lot of uh, educational workshops. Uh, we did a great uh, workshop um, with um, a Lester Longwool sheep and did a card grading demonstration that uh, we actually have up on our website. And it's a great way to select an animal based on productivity and on breed standard. And then um, quite a bit on marketing and promotion. As I mentioned earlier, a lot of our uh, farmers uh, can be brilliant at raising and, and breeding their animals, but when it comes to marketing and promotion, um, they often fall short. And um, we, we do try to help folks along with that. Um, the most major program that we've worked on, and it's been a game changer for our, our rare breeds, is the Shave them to Save Them initiative. And this is a challenge to fiber artists to work through our conservation priority list of wool breeds and uh, make a project with each breed. And so they get, when they join, they get a passport. And uh, when they buy wool from a participant, um, uh, fiber provider, they'll get a sticker for their passport and they have to um, document the project. And then every five breeds that they accomplish a project with, they get a little prize. Uh, but most people don't do it for the prizes, they do it for the bragging rights and to share. And we have thousands of people on the um, Facebook page and um, it's really spread like wildfire. You know, we're coming up on almost 2000 fiber artists that are part of this initiative. And we have close to a thousand um, uh, wool providers um, for this. And the wool providers can be farmers. Uh, some of the farmers that don't want to bother with marketing will sell the wool to fiber mills or, um, or other farmers so they can sell it. And um, it's been an extraordinary success for building market for rare breeds. And, you know, when we talked about the title of this, um, you know, the comeback, um, the shame to save them has been a real game changer. And, um, We've been really pleased with it and trying to figure out ways how we can expand the program. Um, we're hoping maybe something similar could happen in the UK because their breeds are struggling too. And um, for ours, we uh, recently had done a, um, uh, a study of uh, how this program is working for our uh, sheep owners. And it's really been remarkable uh, the, the changes that have happened in just the, the two and a half years that we've had the project. And um, Jay, has that slide advanced yet? Uh, it's working on it here. <laughs> okay. To your survey slide, right? Yes. There we go. Okay. So these are statistics to really pay attention. Um, our, after we did our survey, I mean, roving up 109%, uh, washed fleeces, combed wool. Uh, one thing that was um, unexpected was an increase in sales of hair sheep. And that's because the, the interest of the program got people interested in, in consuming rare breeds too. Uh, so that was a real eye opener for, for our producers. And uh, we certainly have challenges. We still want to try and um, 
uh, you know, educate the general public that aren't really familiar with the breeds that we work with. And uh, a big area is uh, education on wool quality. A lot of our producers were basically composting wool and or not doing anything with it. And um, they could be making a lot more income if they just paid attention to certain details to improve their wool quality. Uh, we will be working on a, a shearing video that we're hoping after things kind of get back to normal and people can travel, uh, we're hoping to put together a um, educational video on shearing that I think is going to be a lot of fun. And um, and hopefully educate folks on that and and then marketing training you know we really want to be able to uh, make our breeders better uh, marketers and um, uh, because ultimately that that makes them more successful and it helps us be successful art in our job in giving these breeds back a job and and you know um, gonna be in agriculture for the long haul but uh, I think that's my last slide, and I was going to be turning it over to Brian. Yeah, we'll get Brian unmuted here. And uh, so Brian Larson's our next uh, speaker, and Brian's owned and managed commercial and purebred sheep for 60 years and working with long wool, Lincoln Long Wolves for 35 years. He's an active member of the Michigan Sheep Producers Association, the Na National Lincoln Sheep Breeders Association, which is a U.S. association, and then the Lincoln Long Wool Sheep Breeders Association, which is a U.K. association. Of course, he's a member of the American Sheep Industry Association, and he's also a current uh, board chair for the Livestock Conservancy. So, Brian, if you are ready to go, I think I, I think you'll be able to advance your slides. Uh, my apologies to our audience. We are working across three different time zones and several thousands of miles with all of our speakers. So, hopefully, this is goes as smoothly as we can. But Brian, it's, it's your floor. Thank you, Jay. Uh, Heritage long wool breeds apparently evolved from curly fleece Roman Empire imports to occupied England centuries ago. Uh, there have been several large DNA mapping studies that place the long wool breeds in an extreme branch of the ovine uh, DNA genome. Uh, their genetic distance from other breeds may account for many of the uh, commercial breeds that have been created by crossbreeding with heritage long wool breeds. Uh, many heritage breeds uh, beyond the long wools occupy remote branches of the DNA genome, which make them exceptional sources of genetic diversity. If I get my timing down on changing pictures here. Is it working for you? Uh, go ahead and move it yourself if you can. Give it a shot here. There we go. There we go. Now, my personal experience, as was said earlier, is with the Lincoln Longwell, so most of the pictures of this presentation are of that breed. Uh, the Cotswold and the Lester Longwell breeds were devel developed in a contemporaneous time period in the late uh, 1700s and early 1800s in uh, the respective regions of uh, England. The other Longwell breeds, not all of them are on our conservation list, but they include the Teeswater, uh, Wensleydale, Romney Marsh, Border Lester, and the Blueface Lester. Go ahead and change. Hmm. There we go. There we go. So the fleece characteristics differ among the long wool breeds by lock or staple length or lock and staple width, by the boldness of the crimp, or in other words, crimp per inch, and fiber diameter. Long wool fleeces are also distinctive with a bright, shiny luster, which you can see in this picture. Long wool fleeces are notable for their high yield and low shrinkage, and they spin extremely well. 
people get thrown off by the fiber diameter and think they'd be hard to spin, but they're a very soft uh, handling fleece. Long wools differ on the heft and weight of annual wool production. Uh, this uh, photo demonstrates a Lincoln long wool fleece with locks that are two fingers wide and crimp, which is a finger width apart. Next slide, please. So the lock and stable develop, staple development is critical to the long wool breed's wool quality. Having been developed in temperate climates, the locks shed rain and debris while protecting the wool fibers inside the lock. This photo is of a six month growth after a rain shower. And notice how the drainage is facilitated by the direction of the locks. Change the slide, please. So the long wool breeds are generally regarded as a large high volume sheep. Uh, they're intended to be wide in the chest and back. They stand on strong, heavy boned legs. And this conformation reflects their ability to consume large amounts of high quality forage and carry multiple births. As you can see by this picture, long wolves are alert, intelligent, but yet still very calm. Long wool breeds are noted for dark noses and ears, sometimes called the blue in color. Natural colored fleeces, as opposed to the white fleeces, are more common in past history due to the popularity of colored wool. Next slide, please. Um, fleece, conformation, and breed character have been enhanced by the use of stricter selection criteria using North American genetics alone or by using imported semen from the UK Lincoln long wool rams. Other long wool breeds have also used imported semen to improve compliance to breed standard or to breed up to purebred standards. This picture of uh, UK sires uh, are those whose offspring currently reside in the United States. And in addition to that, three new Un uh, United Kingdom Lincoln long wool sires are available for breeding this year. You can change the slide. With each generation of stricter US genetic selection or using imported UK semen, uh, the long wool breeds are reinforcing their breed standards. We, are mo we must recognize that the that form leads to function, or in other words, if you change form, you change function. The function of heritage breeds is their strength. If you deviate from breed standard in a heritage breed, they lose their genetic advantage. Next slide. Heritage breeds need more knowledgeable breeders to ensure their survival. There is a great wealth of experience in the US of capable sheep breeders who could take on the challenge of preserving heritage sheep breeds. The show ring is a conundrum for heritage breeds. However, educating judges will, will enhance the progress to reach heritage breed standards. Next slide. In conclusion, Long wool breeds have high quality, heavy, lustrous fleeces. Their productivity comes from large, high volume bodies that are adapted to consuming large amounts of high quality forages in temperate climates. And yes, the long wool breeds are the luxury models of the sheep world. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Brian. So next up is Leslie Johnson and Leslie, I'll let you uh, get ready on your end. And um, let me go ahead and switch this over here. Leslie Johnson has been a shepherd and fiber artist in Oklahoma for over 35 years. 
Her flock, J. Cambar Farm, features registered American Caracool sheep born in shades of reds through browns that exhibit distinct color retention into the adult fleece. So, Leslie, go ahead. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I want to talk about the Caracols. They are one of the oldest known sheep breeds that are native to the deserts and the mountains of West Central Asiatic Russia. And in this region of high altitude and scant vegetation and limited water, caracals develop to be uniquely hardy. Known as the Persian lamb, they were the sheep of royalty, producing a fur pelt highly valued through the ages by nobility, bartered and trader, traded over the ancient caravan trails and trading centers. So treasured, governments impose strict prohibits on caracal imports or exports. Oh, I tried to click and I lost my picture. Can you click it, move it forward for me? Yep. Okay. Securing caracal seemed impossible with bans on exports, 1,200 miles of journey across the desert to the nearest port, long ocean voyages, and navigating government regulations and quarantines. And yet, incredibly, between 1908 through 1927, 87 caracal imports arrived in the U.S., the foundation for an emerging fur industry. Volume was critical for this developing project. Caracal rams were bred to local ewes of other breeds with the singular idea of building large numbers of pelt producers. And as a result, the American caracal is likely to carry genes of Lincoln, Navajo, and other breeds. Next, please. The, uh, hmm. the caracal difference from all other sheep breeds, lustrous, tight curls of the lamb birth coat is one of the most distinctive. No other sheep pr produces this. Next, please. And D, it even comes in colors other than black. Next, please. Another important trait of the caracal is the top line. This slide shows what it looks like before it's shorn, and then you can see it has a very distinct top line. Tall at the shoulders, tall at the rump, and then sloping into the, the tail on the end. You can also see the luster that's provided after the shearing. Next, please. And this is one of the traits of the caracals, and it varies greatly. These are to use, and you can tell there's a great ex extreme in differences in sizes. These have been docked many times. The lamb will have a lower appendage. Okay, next, please. Okay, other characteristics of the caracals, you have rams that are pulled or have horns. Next, please. While ewes are generally pulled, we do get horned ewes at times. Next, please. And ears. What do you like in an ear? Do you like them short? Do you like them long? Do you like them in between? The caracals kind of have a great variety of ear shapes. Next, please. And wattles. Caracals don't generally have wattles, but they do occur on occasion. Next, please. Um, once the uh, major economic importance furs fell out of fashion in the mid-50s, the collapse of the fur market ended outlets for lamb pelts in the U.S. Many flocks were sold off while other breeders continued with their flocks based on the caracal's other attributes and adaptabilities. What these early breeders said about the caracals? The caracals are able to reach as high as, an, as a cow, which enables it to eat the seed-bearing parts of the weeds and brush. There are 500 weeds in the U.S., and the caracal eats most of them. And to the point of hardiness, no domestic animal in America can compete with the caracal except the burrow and the Mexican goat. Caracals are ideal for sustainable livestock systems, valued for low input management. They have strong and lasting teeth, key to their longevity, resistance to internal parasites, and foot rot. 
They have a strong, strong flocking instinct, intelligence, hardiness, and the ability to survive. Next, please. Ewes are easy lammers with strong maternal instincts, very protected of their lambs. Ewes can be milked and they will breed out of season. Next, please. Beginning with the Black Sheep newsletter back in 1974 and expanding to NCWGA in the 1977, growing attention in the fiber arts created interest and opportunities for caracals. They were being shown at fairs and festivals, breeders meeting and connecting as a group, fleeces were in demand for spinning, weaving, felt making. Once dominated by black fleeces, caracal breeders strive for the other colors to their caracal flocks to meet this new market. Um, and you can see the great diversity in this group of the colors that are available. Next, please. Um, the adult fleas can have diversity from animal to animal. If you see these ewes, you can see that some of the fleeces are very straight, while others have curl. There's some that show a great deal of luster, and um, so they can vary. They're, in some cases, they're double coated, which means they have a um, short, fine undercoat and then a, a coarse, sturdier outer coat. And um, uh, and they can feel quite soft. Next, please. Okay, why red? I picked on having red caracals. I live in Oklahoma. We have red clay soil. Everything turns red at some point or another. So I thought maybe I'd kill two birds with, with one stone and start to see if we could get red in our flock. Um, but I had to do some research. Um, I found out that the um, caracal, while it's dominantly black, variations of the recessive brown could present. So their recessive is brown. And I was, after hunting a while, I got this picture in the mail from um, a breeder up in Colorado. And I quickly went and purchased several of their lambs. And then in 1987, their foundation sire was available for sale. And he was a big, strong uh, red ram who had held his color very nicely and had continued to um, maintain, um, produce red lambs. But what I discovered was that caracals have a fading gene. The deep color of the lambs can lighten in time, generally after the first shearing. But my foundation ram didn't do that. So I continued to add caracal ewes with red faces and legs from breeders across the country to my flock. Next, please. These are a couple of my ewes, my red ewes on the right. And as you can see, you can see the color is still present at, at underneath the, um, the tips here. Um, these ewes are 12 and 15 years old, so the color has remained with some of them. Next, please. These are, one on the left is a lamb, the other two are yearlings. They got caught in the rain, and that's one way to, for me to check the color and how it's developing is to see them in after a rainstorm. Next, please. This is mom and baby. Um, this, you can see the difference from the way their fleece looks to what their adult coat looks like and how the color changes. Next, please. Um, in the vintage caracal literature regarding the inheritance of color, Brown caracals, deep brown to light tan, and everything in between is referred to as cambar. This is the definition I use when I pursued um, the flock in my color, and that thus became the name of my farm flock. Next, please. And this is the delight, is after the shearing. Am I still on track with maintaining the color after the fleece is gone? Next, please. Um, I became a shepherd and a fiber artist almost simultaneously, practicing the skills of spinning and weaving. Ultimately, I discovered that felting best suited my sensibilities. And I have most of my wool carded into bats for that purpose. Next, please. 
Um, my work tends to be um, more utilitarian, making best use of the strength of the carical fibers with designs inspired by traditional patterns. Next, please. So what is in the future for the caracal? Certainly it seems there continues to be a place for the caracals with a growing interest in the homestead and small farm living. Other opportunity is more of a mixed blessing. The emergence of the fat tail ethnic meat market provides two options for the caracal breeder. One, increased sales of caracal lamb for consumption, and two, sales of caracal ewes as first generation crosses for other fat tail breeds um, for the semen imports to create preferred enormous tails. Both are terminal markets in the heritage breeders may have some concern about losing significant genetics through these activities. In the, early 19, in the early 90s, two scholars shared similar thoughts that while the caracal is a classic example of an ancient breed with historical significance, it will remain a minor breed in the U.S. dependent on devoted shepherds who are passionate about the uniqueness of this breed. Okay, that is the end. All right, thank you, Leslie. You are welcome. Yeah. So next we go out to Colorado, uh, where Uji McGuire and her husband Ken of Paonia, Colorado, have been breeding Black Welsh Mountain Sheep for over 20 years. She has served as the registrar for the breed since 2000 and has worked with the USDA in developing non-surgical artificial insemination techniques for over 13 years. So Uji, you want to go ahead and tell us about your Black Welsh Mountain Sheep? Well, the black sheep have to go last. Uh, we are the black sheep, and they are supposed to all be totally black. Black Welsh Mountain are the only all black breed in the world, whereas other breeds do have black individuals. The black Welsh are supposed to be entirely black. There are records in England in abbeys that show and document Welsh Mountain sheep being kept as the blacks separate from about the 1300s. Uh, there's been some recent DNA research done on the entire group of Welsh mountain breeds of which there's, depending on who you talk to, anywhere from 10 to, to 20 different Welsh mountain breeds. And in general, the Black Welsh mountains have shown to be much closer to the Viking sheep based on a DNA analysis, and they are distinctly different in many characteristics from other Welsh mountain breeds. So they are a, definitely a unique resource. In the UK, the Welsh mountain ewe is the second most popular ewe for crossing to long wool breeds to produce either a Welsh mule or a Welsh half-bred. Welsh mule is a blue-faced lester over a Welsh mountain ewe, and a Welsh half-bred uses a border lester as the ram sire. And then those crossbred animals go on down to the third tier and are typically crossed to a terminal sire for meat animals. The purebreds uh, of the mountain ewes, like the Welsh mountains, will stay typically out in the mountains up on the hills. And that is sort of their place in the UK three-tier breeding scheme. Here in the US, all the black Welsh mountain sheep in North America, and we register both the US and Canadian populations, they were all imported in 1974 by Mr. Tom Wyman, and he brought in uh, three rams and 13 ewes, but some of them died before leaving offspring. So our founding population is actually nine ewes and two rams. And then we have added see, imported semen from three different UK sires. We've had a problem with getting more semen in, in that many of the best Black Welsh Mountain flocks are in areas in the UK that have a mandatory Schmallenberg vaccination and the USDA's required test shows vaccinated animals as carriers. And so we haven't been able to get any Black Welsh rams to pass the USDA test because they've been vaccinated. So that's why we haven't been able to bring any more semen in recently. Uh, this is our flock. Obviously, this is a year where we had water as opposed to this year. Right now, these pastures we pasture under our apple orchard are uh, right now all to totally brown 
except for the small bit of snow that we just got today. Three days ago, it was in the 90s, and it'll be back in the 90s in about three days, and we're supposed to have snow tonight. Um, these are some of my U's. This is actually my current top ram. This is Tiberius down here at the bottom. And he's a uh, little over two and a half feet tall at the shoulders and weighs about 180 pounds. So these are primarily a meat animal. Um, this U, they're very good mothers. This U has put her lambs inside a hollow tree trunk to protect them from the, the weather which has been an important thing. And let's see if I can advance forward. And, nope, I'm not able to do it either, Jay, so go ahead. There we go. Uh, Black Welsh have some distinct advantages as a heritage breed. They do high performance on forages alone. In the US, over all the flocks, the lambing average percent is somewhere around uh, 130 to maybe 140 percent. In the UK with a little better feed they can get up to over 200 but they'll do that with no grain and we've had use they could easily raise twins we have had used raised triplets just on straight pasture and not even really lush pasture you know, fairly uh, not not high quality pasture. They are very rugged sheep that survive. They are easy lambing. Uh, in a couple of years ago, Wales, there was a major blizzard during lambing and a lot of sheep died. They were buried under snowdrifts feet deep and they would be digging them out and could find the Welsh mountain ewes had lambed and still had their lambs alive under several feet of snow. Uh, one of their big advantages is excellent meat quality and sort of the unfair marketing advantage is that you can butcher them at any age. So we routinely butcher our cull ewes and sell them as prime mutton. And it takes a while to get people to try it because of the word mutton. But once they do, it should they should really like it. If they like lamb, they'll like our mutton. And they'll typically like any good mutton. There can be some very bad, strong flavored mutton but when it's done right and from a breed that produces mutton, it's, it's a very tasty meat. They are a small breed in terms of size and height, although they can get pretty hefty as, uh, you know, my Ram Tiberius is pretty good to use. We're at about 120 to 130 pounds full grown. Um, and Jay, if you can move on to the next slide, please. So all breeders like to tell you all the good things about their sheep. Um, in the Black Welsh, we faced a problem because of the black sheep that sometimes people buy them because they really want just an unusual color or an unusual sheep. So I always like to make sure everybody knows about the disadvantages. Welsh mountain sheep are non-flocking. This means that they will expand to the limits of the fence. So you're not going to keep them in a small area and have them just graze around a little area unless you do it with some sort of portable fence. The rams are horned and this can cause fencing issues. Uh, we have given up on trying to use electric nets with our rams because the horns are insulating and so they will push against the fence. They don't get shocked until they're in it and get truly tangled. Uh, I know of at least one Black Welsh flock where the rams in that flock pasture together and they figured out how to gang up on the lowest ram on the totem pole, shove him into the electric fence so he gets tangled and then everybody else jumps out over the top of him. So this can be a problem. They are very smart. Uh, that's not always good. However, they do learn to come when called. They do learn to watch you. We don't use any herding dogs. I just, you know, point with a crook and tell them where an open gate is and they'll look for it and find it when I need to move them. They are a slow to medium growth animal, so you're not going to get to butcher size really fast. That can be a problem. Uh, because the wool is solid black, that requires some creative marketing. And for us, the Shave Em to Save Em program that the Livestock Conservancy started 
has been absolutely vital in really improving our wool market. In the UK, Black Welsh wool has its own wool grade and is sorted and sold separately from all other classes of wool in the UK. It's a medium to coarse fiber, so it's typically used for upholstery, outerwear, you know, sweaters, rugs. Most of the time, it's not going to be next to skin soft for most people. Um, our biggest disadvantage in North America is our limited gene pool because of our small foundation. And that has meant that we are need, we need breeders that are very aware of the genetic issues and how you can maintain bloodlines within a small gene pool so that you always have a place to go that's a slightly different animal for an outcross if you start seeing inbreeding depression. Uh, right now, the national, the national flock, U.S. Canadian flock, the average inbreeding coefficient in our animals is somewhere around 0.2 to 0.25. Uh, varies a little bit up and down, but we've had animals that were practically clones. They, they were as, as tightly inbred as you can, where going back, there was basically a single sire for many generations, and that can definitely cause some issues. Uh, on the other hand, you know, they always taste good and there's never a problem putting even an old ram in the freezer. You're not going to get a gamey or strong flavored meat when you do that. So that's a, a definite advantage for them. But they're probably not a beginner sheep, although they've been promoted that way because they're very easy to care for. Their intelligence and fencing issues and non-flocking mean that they don't behave like most people expect sheep to behave. And for some people that's hard. If they've, they've dealt with other livestock like cattle that are not a really tightly herding group of cattle, they'll be fine. But if they're expecting sort of the, the vision that a lot of people have of these nice cute little sheep all grazing together, that's not what black Welsh do, they just scatter. So on the other hand, I love them. Fantastic. Thank you, G, and thank you to all of our speakers for uh, sharing their stories and their sheet with us. If I could get everybody to turn their microphones back on, and if you guys have your camera and want to turn it on, that's fine. We'll see what we have for questions that have come in. And I think we actually have quite a few of them. Uh, let's see what we got here. Yeah, let me go back up here to the beginning. Okay. Is there a way to have DNA tests for lost registrations? And I think that came in when Jeanette was just talking about the Livestock Conservancy in general, but uh, Jeanette or any of the others wanna take that question on? I, I can tell you what the Welsh Mountain Sheep do is we do not accept that. And the problem is in spite of the fact you can do a DNA analysis that can compare breeds, it's very hard to place an individual animal into a breed strictly on the basis of a DNA test, unless you go for a, a full genome sequencing. The other uh, use of DNA testing would be parentage. Yeah. And uh, that can be used to determine who the parents are and if the offspring is of those parents. Okay. And there's a really inexpensive parentage verification test that's available through actually Superior Farms. That's $20, $20 a head to, to do it. So you could parentage verify a lamb for $60, which is unheard of. Mm -hmm. So Jeanette, does the Livestock Conservancy do any DNA analysis at all? Um, we we do uh, more to understand uh, relationships between um, breeds and um, you know to try and understand the the breed themselves a little bit better. 
Um, but we haven't done a, a load of, of DNA with, with sheep, um, not to say we, we won't, um, it's just uh, we, we haven't done uh, any major studies up until now. Okay, and while I have you mic'd up, somebody asked, will the Shave Them to Save Them program be a continuing program for the foreseeable future? Well, we're certainly looking for funding for it. And, uh, you know, in talking about the uh, statistics uh, that have now, you know, we've discovered through the survey, um, it really is making a difference for people. And so we certainly want to try and um, keep it going. Um, we've also uh, started expanding the message to universities and developed a uh, partnership with the Parsons School of Design in Manhattan. And they're actually incorporating biodiversity into their fashion design school and getting um, students excited about it. There's even been a um, scholarship created for a, is a senior that is interested in doing their uh, final seniors project with rare breeds. And so um, a lot of these kids, um, they they're not they don't even know wool comes from sheep in some cases, which which blows my mind. Um, and to put uh, raw fleeces in their hands, um, it's it's just um, quite a, a game changer for them as a student. And um, we're looking to do um, uh, some more outreach with that and and uh, other universities. And I'm I'm already hearing hints that. Now that the Parsons is doing it, some of the others are kind of following suit too. So yes, we very much want to expand it. It's it's a matter of funding, and it all got started with a, a grant that we had gotten several years ago, and that grant's coming towards an end. And so we're we're looking for other sources of funding, and and um, uh, people are excited to keep going with it. So now we've got to come up with different challenges to get people, uh, you know, excited beyond just putting the stamps in their passports. So uh, we've been having some interesting brainstorming about uh, different ideas. And so uh, keep your eyes peeled on our website because there will be things up and coming in the future. Okay, thank you. We had some Caracol questions come in, Leslie. Um, so some people were confused by the terminology and they wanted to know if caracals have fur instead of wool. So newborn lamb, they was referred to as Persian lamb and it was referred to as fur and in the fashion industry is referred to as fur. Now, um, and it's, the, the the locks that are formed on the newborn lamb stay tight up until well it varies but usually with after they pass the first week the weight of the wool starts to open up and the curls start to diminish and I believe there's probably a point where it's no longer considered fur but that's what the originally what caracals were called were a fur sheep. Okay. And somebody from Colorado says that they raise caracal sheep would love to find out how they connect to Leslie or learn about how you do your fleece or marketing of the fiber. Well, I think I, I mean, I have a Facebook, Jay Clumber Farm has a Facebook page. You can connect there that way. Okay. And uh, the other question on caracals was, are they good for targeted grazing to control fire prone biomass? And other speakers can weigh in too on the targeted grazing question if they have anything for their um, opinions, but. It, the picture I showed was a ram that was lifting his weight all the way off the ground to browse. They are excellent in browsing. They prefer browse to pasture. They go after the weeds, they go after the shrubs, they go after the trees, and then if there's anything left, then they'll eat the grass. Um, but they are terrific for um, browsing. However, what I began to understand about that is that behavior is a learned behavior, and not all caracals seem to have picked it up. They tend to, but they, they learn that behavior from their parents, or from their moms at least, and I work 
I trim and prune a lot and feed straight to them to, to, to make sure those lambs get that, that understanding of what browse is all about. Okay. Thank you. And I don't know if Uji or Brian have anything to add on the long wools or the black I, I act On our black Welsh and our flock, I keep track of any sheep that will eat thistles. And that's almost a pass to the butcher trailer. You're not going to go go on it if you're a thistle eater, because we want you around. Uh, so, I mean, it is definitely something that they will do and can learn. Right now, because there's no grass, our sheep are actually starting to eat nut sedge. So. Uh, Lincolns are not necessarily a browse breed. They, uh, for instance, multiflora rose, if it's kept small, they'll eat the leaves off. But uh, Lincolns are, uh, they like high cuisine and that's where they thrive. You know, a lot of the uh, American breeds like uh, Hog Island and Santa Cruz, Santa Cruz is being used in Southern California for um, brush removal and uh, Hog Island's superb for that as well. I've seen them get turned out into a lush pasture and they made a beeline for the bushes and trees <laughs> before they started on the grass and and uh, Jacob sheep too were a good uh, browser and I've actually seen um, Jacob sheep used uh, in the inner city in Indianapolis and uh, there was a program going on where they would have the Jacob sheep in empty lots to graze the empty lots in the middle of the city and um, and they would move the animals from lot to lot to keep the the grass and weeds down and um, so there there are a number of the heritage breeds that would be great for uh, brush removal and weed removal. Awesome and thank you all for chiming in on that. We have some location questions and so the first one's for Uji and the Black uh, Welsh Mountain Sheep, producer in, near Portland, Oregon in the northern Williamette Valley. Um, do you think they'd do well there? And then the second part of the question was how, I think the answer is yes, but how do you recommend them for meat production? Uh, very tasty is on the meat. I'll answer that first. In terms of that location, that's a pretty much a perfect location. Our largest groups of Black Welsh Mountain Sheep are in the Northwest and in the Northeast. So they tend to do better. They do not do well in hot, dry climates. We have had the occasional breeder try them down in Texas um, and not successful. We had one in Tennessee that was fairly successful in getting a uh, flock there, but they're really more of a higher mountain environment or a wetter environment. And so, you know, Oregon, they would do, there's a lot of sheep up in, in uh, Washington state. And you, know, okay. you can certainly go out to the Black Welsh website and uh, look up information there. And we have a forum where we're starting to put more sheep for sale. And you can always send me an email and I can send you a breeder's list. A lot of our breeders have not wanted to be on the internet so I have to have a specific request before I'm allowed to give out their names and numbers. Okay. And the uh, other location question was with the caracals. So Leslie, they wanted to know if the caracals would thrive in a southeastern climate, specifically the state of Georgia. Um, caracals do pretty good everywhere, but they don't like wet feet. So as long as you can get them up and on dry places especially in the evening they should do okay but they do not like marsh you know c continuous marshy ground at all okay thank you and a couple of questions on the lincolns um so brian is there an online herd book for lincolns well there's an online website and uh, if you just look for the national uh, lincoln sheep breeders association on the web uh, they have a good directory, and uh, it's uh, divided by state, and, uh, you know, that's quite accessible. Okay, and the other one was, how do you access the semen from UK for Lincoln sheep? Uh, the semen is uh, in the hands of uh, six breeders in the United States, and uh, uh, people can... Um, 
contact me directly if they want to know who has a semen. I do not sell semen myself. Uh, the semen is in the hands of people all across the country, and uh, I can put you in contact with them very easily if they contact me. Okay, thank you. Um, and a question for Uji on the AI. Do you see non-surgical AI as being an important tool in the near future in recovering heritage breeds? Absolutely, but with caveats. What we found in the research is that we were exceeding the success rates that we were getting with surgical AI with the final result, but that success with the non-surgical procedure is highly breed dependent, primarily due to differences in the ovulation times of the use after synchronization, and that you have to test to get that. So um, Dr. Purdy, Dr. Philip Purdy at the USDA's National Animal Germplasm Program is the head researcher on all of that. And he has both the techniques available out on the USDA website, what we learned during our multi years of research, and also can you can talk to him about what we found didn't work. Um, sorry to say the, the long wolves were one of the breeds that were almost impossible to get the non-surgical procedure to work in. And we think that was a timing issue I didn't have any to try. I don't know what he's done with that since. I know the research has continued, but you know, when we got up to 75 to 80 percent pregnancies on a non-surgical procedure, that was good enough when our surgical procedure was, you know, less than 10 percent. Okay, and a caracal question came in on breeding. It says, do caracal ewes have breeding issues with the fat tails? Leslie? It depends on the size of the tail and uh, the ability of the ram. It's kind of a multi uh, question. I have, there's been a recent discussion in there about ewes that have huge tails and um, whether they're getting serviced or not. So um, it's one of those things you have to pay attention to. Okay, thank you. And this is a general question to you, and I'm actually curious in this answer. Um, somebody wanted to learn, they want to learn more about resources to assist beginning operations starting out with a small foundation flock and expanding. Um, any advice mm -hmm. on good, in, good resources for those that are starting out and want to be profitable, or at least not, not too negative on it? <laughs> well, I, I think there are a, a few resources. Um, one, if you're, you're thinking about getting into uh, a rare breed or um, you know maybe it's a breed that's not on the CPL but is is rare uh, we have a book called managing breeds for secure Fu Fu the future and um, it's a really great how-to on the the basics of breed conservation it comes up with conservation breeding strategies how to maximize your biodiversity within your flock uh, it talks about um, forming registries and breed associations and um, uh, all, all kinds of things that can help you in an endeavor with a, a heritage breed. And um, that's available on our, our website, uh, livestockconservancy.org. And uh, we're available too at the office. You can email us or um, call and uh, we'll get back to you and and uh, we're, we're out there to help people be successful okay I've I've done some classes for people here locally of folks who thought they might want to get into sheep and so I had a handout which has some resources a couple of livestock conservancy books and then a couple other books but the other thing I would recommend is for anyone who's interested go find a shepherd in your area and volunteer to come out and help. They may or may not take you up on it because a lot of times it takes more time to explain what you're doing to somebody new than it does to just do it yourself. But that's going to get you an entry into finding out what sheep are in the area and you can start to decide whether the sheep are going to be a fit for you and your farm. I've always recommended to people that they let the sheep teach them. Uh, sheep are very good at letting you know if you're observant what they need and what they want. 
not necessarily that you should feed them all the time, but uh, grazing patterns, uh, you know, where they want to uh, uh, make their bed rests and uh, just ob observant uh, shepherds are always the best. And uh, I kind of scare people, but uh, uh, people talk about uh, sheep not uh, behaving or getting out or whatever. Generally, the sheep act as the shepherd acts. And if the shepherd is calm, uh, the shepherd provides uh, the right choices for the sheep, the sheep will respond. Okay. Thank you all. Um, and a couple of people have asked about financial incentives in a couple of different ways. Um, but the gist of it is, are there any financial incent incentives from the Livestock Conservancy, granting agencies or other resources uh, to begin raising a critical heritage breed? Um, we do have a microgrant program, but the focus is more on people that are already raising the animals. Uh, however, um, there are uh, grants through USDA in particular for uh, promoting sustainable husbandry practices um, and also um, land improvement um, where you could justify bringing in a, a rare breed that might do a better job at that than, than other breeds. So um, my suggestion would be is uh, to go that route if you're just a beginner with a particular breed and wanting to get into them, um, incorporate them into a plan that includes some of the things that USDA is looking for to support. Um, our microgrant program was specifically designed to help people that are already doing a great job with the breeds to help them get to the next level, whether it means bringing in that new ram or adding fence line to, uh, you know, create larger pastures or, or to be able to um, do better selective grazing. Um, you know, there are all different kinds of projects that can support a breed. And we just want to, you know, use the grants as a, a nod to people that are, that are already doing great work. Okay, thank you. And a couple of questions came in on the AI process. Uh, first one, how expensive is the AI process, including uh, importation? And then a question on Uji, what, what semen concentration were you using in your AI? So I don't know if you want to start with that, Uji. <laughs> I, I'd want to go take a look to be sure, because we did part of the research was we did a bunch of different trials with mm -hmm. all different concentrations and media. If that person could maybe email me, I can send you the final paper results okay. on that. But it's typically about double what you would use for laparoscopic or the surgical procedure. However, the non-surgical AI procedure, the costs are much less. We figured our costs per you, not counting the cost of the semen, but just the synchronization and the procedure was under ten dollars a sheet to try because the farm you do it the farmer does it yourself and we actually had a hosted a training class here at our farm where students came from all over including canada and got to actually practice doing inseminations on our use to learn the procedures under dr birdie's tutelage so it's something that any farmer can learn to do um, semen costs for the last time black welsh semen was brought in was running about a hundred dollars a dose. Uh, we're currently trying to get some rams collected in Canada that are a line that's been isolated and bring that down and we're expecting that to come into the U.S. at about hundred and forty dollars per dose for a non-surgical dose which can be split if you decide to go a surgical route. Yes, uh, in the Lincoln breed, and it would be true for most of the long wool breeds, uh, L, uh, laparoscopic insemination works best. And uh, each breed has its particulars. Uh, we have a uh, uh, 
veterinarian who uh, has done a lot of research. And we were, uh, the last year I was breeding AI, we were getting about 70% 70, 70 pregnancies with almost the same rate of uh, twinning as in a natural flock. And uh, it was costing about $50 a U for the procedure. Um, the cost of semen is dependent on how much semen you uh, collect. And, uh, and then I, I have advised my breeders to, because it's a great risk, they have to put a lot of money down up front. Um, I ask them to charge about double uh, of what it actually costs because they have endured the risk of losing all their money. So it's it's costing around $50 per unit of semen. But we bring in uh, oh, about 700 units of semen at a time from three different rams. Okay. Well, it looks like we've uh, run out of time here. I really appreciate all the questions that came in and of course all of our uh... All of our speakers tonight and sharing pictures of your sheep and the story and all of this information with everybody um, we really appreciate that and we appreciate the uh, American Sheep Industry Association and the Let's Grow Committee uh, providing the funding and the resources uh, to make these webinars happen um, we'll uh, look forward to seeing uh, people on a future webinar and uh, we really en enjoyed having everybody on tonight and I want to thank all of you uh, Speakers, once again, just for, just for your great presentations and for your time this evening. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. It's It's been a real pleasure. Absolutely. Okay, with that, everybody have a good evening, and I hope everybody's uh, safe and sound.